Okay, so today I will try to get across to you what our research has been guiding the last four years, roughly at this point, since I focused only on soft robots for the sake of softness, we have started to transition into, I guess, a new era where we are maybe a bit more lenient with soft and hardness and rigidity and taking other inspirations as well. And so today I would like to talk to you about the idea of like, could the Moscow scale the design help with the interactiveness of robots and help with making them actually agents that could be helping you to better interact in a unstructured human centric environment. And we will only be talking about steps towards this goal, but this is sort of like the long term vision. Let me start off with with this here. So this is something you probably all have tried at this point, you can actually do make an image of a cat, no problem whatsoever, uh, using uh, Dali or by now it's ChatGPT and it's, it's features. Or you can also use these uh, tools to have a poem written for you. And maybe some of you probably know where I'm going at here. There was a few months ago, a statement from an author. She's not an engineer. She was saying like, you know, what's the biggest problem with pushing all things AI? It's the wrong direction. I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so that I can do art and writing, not for AI to do my art and writing so that I can do my laundry and dishes. And that was quite telling because as an engineer, yeah, we might be drifting into building uh, like natural language processing sort of like algorithms that can really deal with uh, answering my emails and so forth. But at the end of the day, we don't have these ubiquitous robots yet out in the world that could actually be embodied and could be in our world. And that's what she's looking for. Joanna wants this robot that does laundry dishes. And you can argue maybe that might be the wrong thing to go for, but some of you might also want to have your laundry dishes done in the future. So if you look into robots and what they already can help us with, they can obviously do things such as automotive, structured environments, repetitive tasks. They do this really well. At home, they vacuum probably right now the floor for you. Or uh, they could walk around in a factory and inspect something. But what all of these applications don't do is really a truly unpredictable interaction. Like, it's, there's always some structure to the problem, but really interacting is not happening. It's like something like this, where you would go in a bakery and you would like to take all of these rolls out of the oven, or you would go into a surgery and you would use your robotic hands to do what is needs to be done to do a surgery, or even handling items in a warehouse. Like I was working for a bit at Amazon Robotics, and one of the biggest challenges is still not really solved is to do bin picking. And even in the supermarkets, like all of these shells have to be put in. And I could go on, I could show you millions of other things. I could show you rock climbing. I could show you playing a ball. And at the end of the day, all of these things are interactive things that need to be done. And no matter how good our AI is to reason about the world, this embodied agent that in the end does it needs to have the physical capabilities of rings. So the question really is, why are the robots that we have at the moment so poorly interacting with our world? And that gets me to the scary parts of what robots can or cannot do. They can, they can fail quite miserably, and they can do really impressive treats, but if you would stand next to the robot, it would actually hurt you quite badly. And it can also do very funny things, like trying to do something in the kitchen. Granted, this is an older video, but like, it is something that is still the case that you don't want that to happen next to you in your kitchen. And then it falls over into <laughs> space. So, um, and so would you want that to happen while you're standing next to it, making your coffee? Probably not. So I don't think they're really ready to interact with our humans. So you have to rethink this whole situation a bit and think about new paradigms. One of the things that we do is we obviously start looking into soft robotics for the sake of softness, making our fingers of these robotic hands soft, making the crawlers all soft, but then they're only limited to a space where they can deal fairly badly with gravity, fairly badly with higher forces. And we always claim they were adaptive, but yet they don't have the dexterity and the versatility of our human hands. Then you have the rigid robots. We already have some, you can buy these rigid robotic hands. You can buy open, uh, open hardware, open source lag robots, or you can just buy your unitary robot and start building with this. But they are not necessarily replicating the inherent mechanical impedance that we wanna have from robots. And then there's nature. 
that's us. That's our hands, our legs. That's how animals are generally built for the most part, using uh, all the elements that we know, which is your skeleton, your muscles, your tendons, and your ligaments. So now this gets us to let's start envisioning robots that are somewhere at that space where we are saying we take inspiration from nature. We don't need to mimic nature necessarily, but we start using some of those features. Like we don't have to necessarily use motors in the joints as we do it for most robots right now. We can use contractive elements that can attach and apply the forces to anywhere in the skeletal body. And then we can start playing around with the joints and we can do all kinds of crazy things. So this is just a mock-up. So today I would like to cover couple of works and I won't be able to get into most of what the group is doing, but I want to just put a few highlights there. So I will first talk about what we're doing in terms of swimming robots. And this is biologically based swimming robots. Then about building muscles from this. Then we will talk about translational applications from these muscles, even into medical areas. Then we go into robotic legs and also into new types of electrohydraulic muscles and how they work and what, what is different about them and why they might be interesting for you. And then we will talk about robotic hands and autonomous manipulation and designs for this problem, the thing that I was motivating in the beginning. So let's start off with, if you want to replicate parts of the human body, you could look at the hand, you could look at the joints. And what you have there is the muscles, you have the bones, you have the tendons, and then you have the joints, and there's also the ligaments. So these are sort of the building blocks. Okay, I'm leaving out a couple of other important things like the skin. There needs to be a skin over this, and needs to be a part, part of a few other aspects. But for the most part, these are the things that we're worrying about right now when we're building these more muscle, muscle skeletal designs. And if we take it to an extreme and we focus just on the muscles, then you could say, well, the most ideal way of doing this is why don't we go all the way and build those muscles from actually living cells? Like, why do we have to always deal with artificial components? Why don't we build them from, from uh, living cells? In theory, there is a lot to be said about you could use cells to engineer living robots. And there's also people around the world that have picked up this topic uh, maybe at least for the last decade, it has becoming a more and more of a, an interesting topic. And it also slowly moving into robotics. And so it certainly makes sense to think about, could we make a functionally large scale robot that could be using living cells as part of the aspect? So there is many reasons why this might be good because we could potentially have a self repairing system. So if this muscle is damaged, it could repair and it could also be sustainable because you could probably throw this on the compost once it's done. And if you get the processes for making it also fully sustainable, there is potentially a bright future. But uh, long story short, I will show you our baby steps in this direction and show you what we've learned so far and what is interesting about this. So let's start off with the components. I'm trying to explain this for with this animation that we did last year. So this is basically looking in the muscle and taking out the individual myoplasts that come basically out of these bundles in your skeletal muscle. And you can take them and you can start culturing them. So this is just for, for animation purposes to give you an idea. You start culturing them in the Petri dish. And eventually you start doing this in a hydrogel block. And I'm not saying this is the only way of doing it. This is the way it's very commonly done, coming more from the tissue engineering side. So you have all of these more progenitor cell types of cells that you throw in there. And then you have to start proliferating them and differentiating them until they start building up fibers. So the process starts off with these myoplasts. You have a couple of days, just to give you an idea, three days where you sort of like differentiating them, proliferating them. And then you allow the matrix where you throw them in to remodel. In the end, you get myofibers and those are going to be your muscle units. There's multiple ways of doing this. And just to give you an idea as an overview, you could use something called micromolding. You could do light-based bioprinting or you could also do extrusion-based printing. The last one you're probably quite familiar with because you use sort of these FFF, FDM kind of printers all the time. This is basically using these bio inks and printing them out from, from an ejection unit. And so you see, these are processes, we can do them in our lab and we've built them up in the last few years and we've tried to explore these directions. We start off with very simple 
designs and also just try to catch up with what literature is doing. So one of the things you can do, a very simple approach, if you want to get started with this, is you could use a thin film, have lots of proofs in that film. You have to make that as a sort of like a template. And then you throw muscles on there and you get these contractive units on there. Another thing you could do, and this is something that Rita Raman made an excellent protocol on and showed how to do this, is you could make these muscle rings and put them onto a construct where you can actuate it and contract. So we've tried this out and it does work. It works really repeatedly. I can tell you it was one of the few protocols that we took in our hands, tried to reproduce them, and it did work from the get-go, as long as you stick with exactly the same recipe. So <laughs> then the recipe is quite important here. So you realize that everything matters in these recipes from the nutrients to what hydrogel you use, from which manufacturer you get them from in order to reproduce this. Because as an engineer, you don't want to have a huge sort of like viability issue and sort of yield should be fairly high for sets of experiments that you set up. So we then start exploring one of the directions, which is this volumetric printing. And so the thing that I think will happen in the next few years is that we will start using a method called solographic um, volumetric printing. And this is basically a method where you use two lights of different wavelengths and you throw them onto a construct. And this allows you to polymerize very selectively a whole bath of material. And you could throw into this bath cells and then allow these cells to grow into a muscle construct. The, tr the problem at the moment is, and we are in the middle of doing this, this process only was invented three years ago or four years ago um, for polymers, not for, for inks with living cells in it, just for pure polymers. And so getting this process to work that actually cells survive in it is quite tricky. <laughs> So what we start is we first get a printer and we start figuring out to make it at least biocompatible by seeding cells on top of this construct. And in the end, we manage to get these scaffolds, we throw the cells on them, and then we get this actuator. And this is a matured bioactuator on the scale of about two centimeters. So with this, with this bioactuator, we start looking into design optimization to get performance and swimming optimization out of this actuator. It was not really inspired by anything. It was literally just us knowing that with grooves, we can produce a scaffold where they can grow in. And then we want to see how this muscle contracts. So we started off with different designs of different lengths. This is always showing you half of this design. So this is like six millimeters in length. And we started observing how does this thing contract and what does it do? And it didn't really like it too much. So we had to prolong this construct quite a bit to get larger constructs out of this. So this was then one of the designs we kind of like got to, we could print them reasonably in this, in this photographic printer. And then after two weeks of maturation, we get these robots out of this. Another challenge was to figure out what does this underlying scaffold material is made of. And it was really figuring out the right recipe so that our muscle doesn't eat up and destroy the underlying scaffold. So the under underlying scaffold had to be strong enough to survive the restructuring process. So that in the end, we get these swimmers out of it. I hope you can see it, which is basically um, a skeletal muscle cultured on this volumetrically printed construct that can swim in, in the Petri dish. And so then we looked into, okay, what can we do in terms of learning from this construct? How does muscle behave in this small scale in this like self-cultured sort of built setting? We looked at, for example, frequency. We're stimulating this externally with two electrodes where we apply a small voltage and it opens the calcium channels in these myoplasts and then it starts contracting. So then what you get here is we can do this for different frequencies. So two hertz, three hertz, four hertz, and five hertz. And it swims faster in a certain given amount of time. And now the question to you is what do you think happens if I go even more, if I'm being more greedy and I go to a higher frequency than five hertz? Stalls, you think? Why does it stall? Okay. Do you know what a human muscle would do if you over training it or over actuating it? Yeah. It's cramping. The same thing happens here. So we get sort of this like tetanus behavior. The, the muscle literally just cramps up like this. And so it's interesting. You can start trying to figure out these things with this model system that's listed in your Petri dish. And you can start, yeah, exploring how does this thing work? And then you can start building more complex system out of this recipe, which we are doing at this moment. But 
So for the beginning, we kind of like showed that we could make a robot that is significantly faster than what was there possible before. And so meaning we want to push a bit the performance limits of seeing how far can we push this young field of building biohybrids because they're nowhere near at the size of a human muscle or of another big scale animal muscle. And we could already achieve fairly good body lengths per minute with this sumo design. So one of the interesting things comes from this is starting to model this behavior. So trying to understand how do you explain the behavior of this muscle with hydrogel underneath? Could you start postulating a model that could explain this behavior? So the first thing we started doing is building up um, a simulator that allowed us to implement a muscle model that explains the muscle contraction, and then starting to put this into a fluid environment so we can like, kind of recapitulate why does the swimmer swim the way it does, and how much is the muscle affecting it, and so forth. So this is a work in progress, and we are currently in the process of understanding this and using our simulator that gives us the ability to tune the different materials that we have in there and also explain the muscle contraction as an additional model. And if you're curious about this, please contact us. Happy to work with you on, on these directions. Also, if you're interested in the modeling side, I already talked with Zach this morning and his group was very interested in this as well. And I think it is going to be something that will affect a lot of the work going forward where we can uh, investigate different lengths, different actuation speeds, and we can start optimizing things in simulation before we go through this tedious process of building them. So with this, I want to just show you a little bit the steps that we're going to take. So this method, this holographic printing, uses a photo initiator that reacts onto two wavelengths. That's like the key behind this. But for this photo initiator to really work out in the end, we need to make it biocompatible. So this is the thing that we're working on, that we can throw the cells directly into the construct. Because at the moment, we were basically putting them on top, and that was fine. So we, we polymerize, we remove any toxic components, and then we can actually make a muscle. We are having to adapt the hydrogel that we're using for this, so it works well for the skeletal muscle. And then we will start to investigate multiple microscale features, because we need to put perfusion system into this muscle to make it bigger. So getting to perfusion, that's an interesting problem because in, in real muscle, we have, we have um, a perfusion system. We have a vascularization in our muscles that sends nutrients to our muscles and removes toxins. And we need the same for myoplasts. So one of the important questions then is how do you do this? So here, once the, the muscle has built up, you actually end up with a construct where you would have dying cells in the center. And I showed you this with with, uh, with this image from a um, histology, where you see that if you are not giving it perfusion up to, a, let's say, 150 micrometers, the cells will just die. So you can't really, you, in order to scale up this process of making thin film muscles to bigger muscles, you need to have perfusion systems in there that with microfluidics push your nutrients through. So what this gets us to is that we that start using extrusion-based printing to build these contract, constructs where we both have this, the bio-inks, we have anchor points, and we have removable perfusion channels in there. And that allows us to mainly make these initial test muscles that we can put into a bioreactors. And so these are the, these anchors, and we, we investigate them afterwards for both the tissue and the channel structures, and also for their perfusibility. And we, in the initial study, had the ability to make them perfusible, but still has troubles to actually make them highly contracted. So that's the next steps in this construct that when you start printing them, you have a good amount of channels in there and you have your initial cells in there and then they start maturing, but then they're also rebuilding and the channels get smaller and smaller as they're rebuilding. So tuning this process and understanding how it works is going to be a big challenge for people to figure out. Another thing that we're looking into is putting putting sensing in there so we can actually measure proprioceptively how the muscle contracts so we can do a closed loop control on the muscle. Because just using a visual system outside is not going to really work in the long term. We want to be able to understand how the muscle contracts. So what we're doing here is we say, okay, so we have a fiber that has an exterior shielding that is biocompatible and in the interior we can read out this resistance. And this allows us to then build these bioactuator rings going back to Rita Raman's design and have them contractive and look at their signals as they are contracting as a muscle and figuring out that this can actually be cultured, survive, and can be controlled in a closed loop. 
So this is sort of the early stages of this research. And I can tell you it's quite tedious. It takes a long time to get to this point. But fortunately, ETH gave us enough allowance to have that patience and to work on this topic. One of the translational things that we're trying to do now with the university hospital across the street is to see, can we actually build these constructs and bring them into a living system to support the living system? So what we're doing here is we're using a volumetric method where you shine laser lights onto, um, onto a, a substrate where you have your cells, in this case, cardiac cells, so muscle cells from the heart, heart muscle cells, and then mature these, and they align along these these lines that you have produced by shining a coherent laser onto the structure. So you're basically having this speckle pattern that comes from the coherent laser, and that speckle pattern causes a microstructure into your, into your construct, and then you get cell alignment from this microstructure, and with this, you can start playing around and start making muscle with multiple alignments, because in the heart, it's very important to get multiple alignments to work, because the heart contracts in a torsional way in your body. And if you want to get a pumping mechanism, you should be able to reproduce this torsional way. So you should be able to align your myoplasts, your cardiac myoplasts into this in the same way. So that's what we started investigating here and started looking at directional tissue that is just sort of polymerized in one direction. And then we can also start polymerizing it to control the deformations in different ways. And one of the things that we started doing is we matching now this, this approach of making these constructs with a metamaterial structure that can be sutured into a heart. And um, the next slide, I will probably skip because I'm not sure if you're prepared for this. This would be a pick heart. I would show you where we're suturing it in. But just for the sake of some of you, so basically we're taking this structure here and suturing it into a pick heart. And if you're curious, I'm happy to show it to you afterwards. Um, and this is the only one that's a bit gross in the slide deck. So I will probably skip for now over it. But the, the point of this, and this is work that we have in progress, is putting this into a pick heart to close the hole that it could have in the septum. And the goal here is really just to make a functional tissue that the surgeon can suture in. So we're still a long way from using a single small muscle to a full robot. And so I started off with this topic of biohybrids to show you the tediousness of this work. And I have a team of uh, five people just working on this topic and it's taking a long time. But we have the patience and we're making progress and as long as we see progress and as long as we're getting funding for it, we will keep working this direction. But I'm also impatient. And um, as all of us are to some extent. And you learn to get, I guess, have patience if you, for example, have children. I have many of them. So it's uh, one of the challenges to overcome is to understand how much patience they have with this problem. And while you still want to build big robots in some way, that's the goal in the end. But that's what I started off with. So really, if you look in the real muscle, with this small two centimeter problem, we are not there at the full leg, which is like a meter long or more. Like two, uh, so what do we do? One potential way of solving this is to say we go to electrohydraulic actuators. So this is a development, you might have seen it, uh, at this point it's like six years ago, where these piano hazel muscles were invented from uh, Christoph Keplinger at UC Boulder at that time. And he basically uh, developed a system that was able to leverage liquid that's embedded in a pouch. And then the way this works is you have an electrode on each side, and this electrode gets a voltage applied, charges applied to it, it acts as a capacitor, and that causes the liquid to be pushed into one side of the pouch. So then overall, the way you could think about this is you basically go from this configuration into this configuration, and it lifts up and shortens. So this is the principle behind this actually. And as a precursor, by no means I'm saying this is an optimal design for a contracted muscle, but it has the promise that we're using directly the electrical charges that come from a battery to, how should I say, the actuation mechanism without all the transitions to go through a pump and through some other domain changes that might introduce entropy. So to really, to really look at this, we started working, playing around with little robotic fish, obviously <laughs> because we like fish. So here is one of these examples where we just made two of these films and we put them into a 3D printed construct and try to see, can we actually make something swim with this? Uh, 
in the beginning, we just put two muscles in there. We had this 3D printed construct with uh, polypropylene and some SEBS around it. And that was our sort of scaffold of our fish. And then we see we had multiple electrodes coming on the side and they were still there. And they had a big elephant in the room because it's not an autonomous system by itself. It's just an initial test. And we then took this to a next stage, uh, like a larger scale by saying, we would like to get rid of modus. And originally when we tried to title this paper, we said, no more modus. We would like to replace electromagnetic motors with electrohydraulic muscles. And the title was something like no more motors and then the actual title. The reviewers totally destroyed it. So <laughs> they did not like this hanger of like calling it normal motors. So there was one very feisty uh, reviewer. So I had to remove it, unfortunately, from the title of the paper. Uh, but I would still call it normal motors. So what you see here on the left, <laughs> <laughs> and it's on the record now, I guess, <laughs> but okay. Um, what you see on the left is our benchmark baseline lag, okay? It's a carbon fiber built lag that we just built for comparison for our lags that we're now testing. So what did you do? We put two electromagnetic motors in there with direct drive. And then what we did is we said, okay, can we take a rotational encoder setup with the electromagnetic motor and replace this with an antagonistic principle? So voila, this is the result. We replace this with a setup where we use multiple pairs of these electrohydraulic muscles. And what they have is, fortunately, it fits from the storyline. They have a muscle, they have a tendon, and they also have joints. They have everything that I was talking about. The only thing that this design doesn't have, it doesn't really have ligaments. Because in this initial design, we only worked with pin joint designs that you're familiar with. So we actually put proper bearings in there and we properly set this up. So but you obviously get way more freedom than with these uh, drive trains directly in your joints. And then we basically say, instead of having a roto rota rotational encoder, you replace this with a self-sensing electrohydraulic muscle. So that means instead of you measuring the rotational angle of your motor, of, of your joints, you're just sensing the capacitive changes of your muscle to then reconstruct the state of your leg. So that means we have electromagnetic motors at the top. We replace them with the muscles. We have the angle encoders. We replace them with the self-sensing capability. You could still put encoders in there if you wish, but not necessarily need them. And then instead of using linear transmissions of multiple gearboxes, you would use nonlinear moment arms because the way where you apply your forces with your tendons tells you the mechanical leverage that you're getting. So now this is the initial design. We have both a hip flexor and hip extensor, a knee extensor and a knee flexor, and a knee joint and a hip joint. And this is sort of like our base state for this leg. And I'm just trying to introduce this to you so you understand a bit what is the stable point if you're operating around with this leg. And then we have multiple voltage amplifiers that run each of these muscles individually. And we have these packs of multiple muscles put together into the setup. So now if I were to run you through this, when your hip, hip flexor contracts, then the leg moves this way. When the knee extensor moves, then it moves this way. And when you then actuate the hip extensor and moves backwards and the knee flexor it moves up. So this is the full cycle of the leg motion. And then we try to look at four sort of key narratives of trying to investigate what does this design do? These were these four narratives, agility, adaptability, energy efficiency, and self-sensing. That's what the four things we want to investigate with this design. So let me talk, let's say first about the agility. So here you, we start doing some jumping experiments just to see how well does this thing jump? This is slow motion. And we tested the forces and we evaluated how well can we take off? How high can we take off? What's the ratio of weight to this muscle to take off? And then we also, uh, tested at different frequencies, and we basically want to characterize its ability to hop. So let me jump forward. Then we also looked at the, uh, the speed of actuation. So we can actuate it fairly slowly, but we can also go fairly high in actuation speed for this leg. So let's move forward. This is three hertz, and this is a slow mo, and five hertz. 
from the task so the system hurts. So you can run this thing really fast. So, and the only thing that you get from this, obviously you're changing the range of motion that you can get to in that short amount of time. But it's the same with my arm. If I were to do this, I cannot reach a full range either, right? So, but we are always operating around the stable point that I showed you earlier, which is this like stable point that you're in, and then you're actuating in this range. And it gives you a bit of stability because if I put this leg onto its own weight, it will not go further than this the state it goes into, and then you can start actuating it. So you have an inherent stability to the design. So what we then tried out was our little sort of like living room setup. So, so here up here, you see the open loop actuation that we just put onto the, on two pairs of the muscles, which is the leg extensor and the leg flexor. And it just inherently hops over all of this terrain adaptively without the need of exclusive control. And obviously, the, the interesting thing is then to do slow mo to show how it's like running the pebble and then the sand and it throws up the sand. And I mean, one, once we got this to work, it was really a lot of work to get to this point because we had to figure out how to make the leg lightweight, how to produce these muscles. Every, each of these muscles is hand produced. You cannot just buy them in some way. And there's some yield to it. So it was quite some uh, um, sleepless nights until we get to this point. And then we also looked at the question of can we. Uh, can we, for example, do different modes? We can do hopping, which is our sort of speed modes. We can do distance modes. So it's just a question of how you actuate this leg. And we can also do the energy efficiency mode, where we're trying to get optimized distance behavior with minimal energy usage. And you can also do the crawler. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that also works. It's obviously not hopping. It wouldn't work on the, on the sand setup. And we also looked at how does the cost of transfer compare of this leg compared to, let's say, a DC motor driven leg or also onto land animals. And it's obviously just a single leg system, but it's already interesting to see how it compares in this context. And then we looked at the heating issue. So this is a thermal camera. A normal electromagnetic motor on the left would get really hot, while the actual sort of like leg, the muscles, they don't heat in the same way. So this is another thing you could think of like in terms of the system being interesting in that you can hold torques and forces quite well because you only produce an entropy when you're changing the charges on the capacitance. So I actually believe that in the future we'll see actuation, which is a coupling of those two principles, really tightly integrated. So this is electrostatic forces and electromagnetic forces into one actuator system that can combine them. But we're not there yet because we still have to come up with those designs that do it in a very integrative manner. But for now, at least it gets us to this point. So another thing that we did here is we tried, for example, to do obstacle detection. So it just runs with, an, with the setup and then it uses the capacitive sensing to change its mode to a larger hopping mode. And this way it detects, you see we have a difference in knee and hip capacitance. And then based on this, it switches its controller and it goes over the obstacle. This was just to show that we can use the built-in capacitance measurement to start being adaptive with the setup. So one of the things I didn't mention to you here is a muscle can usually both contract, but also can be passively expanded. And it's very important to get a large range of motion. With this work, we didn't do that yet. So we just finished this work where we showed that we can actually overcome this issue because initially we had to deal with some tendon slack in order to not have the system to be over taut and to have the two antagonistic muscles to be pulling against each other. Because the hazels by themselves inherently don't have a large amount of extensibility. So what we started doing here is to say, in order to, so contraction is no problem, but as you're contracting, the extension needs to be given by a separate module, we use electrostatic clutches for this. So let's say without the clutch, you have a limited range of motion, but it was fine for the initial leg. With a clutch, we can do a large range of motion to actually build a quadruped that could also lift its leg all the way. So it's a coupling of this contractive muscle with an electro hydraulic, electrostatic clutch. So you might wonder how does this clutch work? It's basically two sliding films that with electrostatic forces can stop at any point that I make to charge them. If I discharge them, they can be slid on top of each other. So if I want my muscle to be extending, I discharge them, and therefore the clutch can be opened. And then there is a fabric around the clutch that pulls it back into shape once I want to start 
contracting the muscle. So this is an interesting principle. And the question is, how can we combine them into one single design? Here, we just put it in series, so having a clutch and a muscle. But in the future, we will have to ask ourselves how to make this a more compact design. Another thing, one of the students, this was a bachelor project, actually, um, that we showed at ICRAM, where we, where we showed, hey, can we not actually make even a shoulder joint? So he coupled multiple of these, put them into a ball joint, and showed that you can actually go into different motions. Just wanted to show to you there's different possibilities of using these muscles. This was one where the student wanted to just try out a shoulder joint because he loves tennis and he loves looking <laughs> into his shoulder. So this was um, the next exploration. So one of the things that we have as a major problem with these is that we need to use high voltage multi-channel drivers. And the reason why this is a problem is the industry has simply not developed drivers that are compact, that, need, that are made for this use case. They don't exist. And the ones that exist, they only work on lower voltages. So instead of getting into power electronics as a lab, we decided to just make the muscles to operate at a lower voltage while still producing similar forces and strains. So what we did is we started saying, okay, we can go from a device that is fairly inefficient in terms of kilowatts per cubic meter in terms of bulkiness and size to a really compact design where we can also modularly put many, many of these MOSFET drivers, but we have to operate at a lower voltage. And so we did this recently um, in contrast with a new actuator design. So we coupled this with an actuator design that we also had to introduce to make use of the lower voltage, like to be able to use the lower voltage. So this is a hazel design. This is maybe a nice way of showing it to you in a different view. You see on the left side, this is the hazel. This is sort of partially contracted. You see on the top, it has zipped together. And then if I zoom into it, this is how it's set up. You have the carbon electrodes, then you have a polymer, non-conductive film that acts as an isolator. Then you have a little bit of oil film in the center, which is like a, it's like basically a vegetable oil. And then you have the same thing on the other side. What do you think is the problem with this design? The impedance, you think? Uh, losses from the layer, you think? So, like, I mean, the electrode material can increase your losses, your resistive losses. The BOPT is obviously also can have a breakdown. So if you know from DEAs or from other electrostatic actuators, the breakdown is quite crucial. But another big problem is you don't want to touch this thing, right? So, but the original design, all the electrodes are exposed. And I'm trying to sell to you like actuators that can be in your living room and you don't want to, you want to maybe touch the robots and you don't want to get at least a small discharge running onto you, right? So, so this is really a big, a big topic. So therefore we just flipped it around and we said, we put the structural layer on the outside, which is the BOPT. Then we put an alum, aluminum electrode and then we put something called a PBDF tap polymer on in the inside. It was for multiple reasons, but one of them is to protect the electrodes. For another reason is this PBDF tap polymer happens to be a really good ferroelectric material, it means it has a high uh, dielectric constant that is specific to this problem that helps a lot to lower the voltage while keeping the forces up. I'm not showing you the equations for it, but it helps a lot to, in this case, be able to lower the voltage by about a factor of six while keeping the forces at the level that we wanted to. The problem with this PBF topolymer, if you were to just use it by itself without the BOPT around it, it would not structurally be strong enough by itself in the thin layer that we want to use. So that's why we put the BOPT on the outside to have a structural layer and also to make it isolated. That also helps with, you can change the design, you don't need any more skirts around the actuator, so you don't have arcs anymore potentially, and you're anyways lowering the voltage. So here is this, we call it the HALVE design, H-A-L-V-E. And it basically has this, these three layers. We call it a composite design. And you run it now at one kilovolt, while previously we were running at eight kilovolts, all at very small currents. But at least we were able to get down by a factor of six to seven. So this is a single action, a single pouch unit with, um, in this case, an aluminum electrode 
of showing how this principle works, the thing is lifting a weight. So we also took this into an etching setup and then we scanned it um, with a scanning electron microscope. And then what we did is we, we end up seeing the layers that we actually were producing with our microfilm techniques of, of plate coding it. This helped us to optimize the process. With this process, we could actually tune our uh, manufacturing steps for these designs. Another thing, and I will talk about this in a second, is just moving everything into a clean room makes a huge difference in reliability. But so, in the end, we can run these actuators. Up this one is here, actuated with 700 volts. You can actually touch them because they are isolated. That was not possible before. And we started building first test setups with this. Um, we also produce different electrodes. The one down here has gold on them. Some others are copper. Some others are aluminum. We try different electrodes to evaluate these setups. So this is, for example, a gripper that pushes its two muscles, contracts them, and the gripper pulls and holds onto an object. So you see with this design, we can actually lower the voltage into a range below 1.5 kilovolts. And this was quite advantageous. With what I think in the future, one of the major challenges with this is that we still need so-called bipolar actuation. So how do you get rid of the necessity to actuate it with alternating voltages? because that's a material property. And we also need to, for self-sensing, we can overcome some of the hysteresis effects in the behavior. And our new design is harder to manufacture because you have now this composite layer. And we also need to move towards clean room manufacturing for this to have higher yield and reliability. Mm -hmm. So now let me jump to the hands, the final part of this. So if we go beyond muscles and we look more on the overall system architecture, that means we also look at the other parts as tendon, bones, ligaments, and joints. I mean, granted, we just did that already for the leg. But when we look at the hands and we not focus on the muscle, we just look at the hands, it's already a fascinating problem to look at. So this here is an animation that I appropriate um, from someone else, but it shows you really the level of dexterity and versatility that a human hand has. And I obviously don't have to convince you, you all have a hand, um, hopefully. Um, and, and, and uh, what you need to replicate to get to this level, I do believe you need some sort of muscle, bone, tendon, ligament, joints, and also skin and other aspects. So here, Thomas, one of the students, is filming his own hands in a very <laughs> interesting way to show the scan where we basically took a scan of our hands and started making a multi-material printed hand out of this. And we not only printed the hands, we also printed the heart, and we also printed a walker. So what we use for this is a method that we call vision controlled chatting. It allows us to do inkjet chatting of multiple thiolines, epoxies, and wax material to allow us to interspine different rigidity of materials into one print. And you might say, hey, wait a second, I already have a Cerasus uh, Colex and I, a Polyjet and I can print this. Yes, true, but these materials are crappy. Sorry for my <laughs> thing, compared to what we can print with this system. And the key idea here is, I'm trying to show you this with this animation. The key idea is when you are basically printing, you put a layer down and then you shine UV light onto this layer of, of voxels. In the traditional method, you use a mechanical scraper that you see here in the center. And that mechanical scraper is actually a problem. Because so you put those droplets down, you always chat a bit more out of your little piezo inkjet nozzles, talking about thousands of these nozzles that put materials down. And then you have the scraper that has to smoothen them out. But that's a problem. You don't want that because it destroys the resolution and it also limits you to only certain polymers. You can only use acrylates or polymers that use rapid polymerization. That means you shine UV light on it, it polymerizes right then and there, and then it's done with the job. But that really eats at your material properties. So what we then did is we said, okay, we do not do this anymore. We use a camera to scan the surface and therefore scan really all of the voxels to see where did we print a little bit too much and where did we print too little. Because you can never get those inkjet nozzles to be perfect. They always will have a probability distribution function in some way. So going back to the joke we had earlier, there is always a distribution of these voxels, of these voxels that you're printing in terms of volume size. And so in order to get this straight, we need this scanning laser where we put a laser over it and then we scan over the surface and then we look at the unevenness of the surface. And then we can start producing, for example, the hands here. This is in a matter of, um, of a few hours, it's printed. 
and it has the wax support material underneath, which is removed after the print. And so then we start off with our model, we slice it into bitmap levels, and then we run it, print it, and scan every layer. And in the next layer that you print, you adjust for each drop, um, each voxel, each droplet that you put down according to what your scan has, has set to you. This way you don't need a scraper anymore because you have a closed loop system. So the chemistry is that you're going away from acrylates, which have this chain growth mechanism, which is really random and irregular in its distribution of monomers, towards a step growth setup, where you can use thiolene, you can use epoxies and other materials that can have a much longer time to do their polymerization. Because you're not touching them, you can have them actually polymerize for hours even after the print is done. It just needs to polymerize enough that the viscosity goes a little bit up that you can print on top of it but it doesn't need to have come to its final material properties. So what's nice about this is we basically, and these are the key things. When I did my PhD and I was looking at smooth materials and other soft robotic materials, it was always looking at the elastic modulus and at, at the elongation to break. When you use the traditional method of acrylates on a, on a Stratasys polyjet system, what you get is you get material deterioration after a few hours the material changes its properties and becomes quite brittle. So I show you up here on the elongation modulus, uh, Tango Black Plus is the material that we put compared to. We also compared to Agilus. These are the soft, well, some of the soft materials that, that they use in these systems. And the el elastic modulus stays constant for thiolene, which doesn't, which requires this contactless principle, while for mm -hmm. the acrylate, which is the Tango Black Plus, it goes up by a factor of 259x. So that's quite bad in that sense. And we also get a much better, better hysteresis. So the question to you is why you think does the hysteresis matter? The hysteresis in sense of stress to strain. Like you as an engineer using this to print something, why does the hysteresis matter? How does it make it effective to you? Maybe somewhere you can think about this. If you push on your hands and you push in here and it bounces back. If you have a high material hysteresis, then it doesn't bounce back directly. It's so dampened in this process as you're pushing down, it comes slowly back. And that's a problem with agilose. That's a problem with these, um, with these chain growth materials. And we don't have that problem as much anymore. So the material feels, and I can show you a sample. I have one in my backpack later on. A material feels much more like a rubber material and not so much like a polyjet material. So then we build a couple of toys with this. So this is our walking robot with legs and it can walk and it can pick up objects. We also build hands with this and we showed that these hands can be actuated. And here we actually printed also the tendons. So it's, it's a skeleton, it's a bone from the human hand scan. And then we have capsules around it. We have ligaments in the capsules. We remove the wax from the inside. And then we also have tendons that are printed. The tendons are printed from a soft and rigid composite uh, design structure. And we could pull on them and move them around. Granted, we have to do a further job to increase their ultimate um, yield strength, but we could already use them to actuate them. So then we also build a hand where we could put McKibben muscles into it and actually actuate it with the McKibben muscles and try out different motion ranges. This was just a follow-up to show that you can actually build a full hand with the setup and try to do object grasping. So, okay, so I... I was trying to bring across this idea of using the system, and I do believe you can try to use this setup. And the good news is you can actually, and I have no monetary interest in this, I'm not affiliated with the startup, you can actually order these prints, okay? So if you want to print something yourself or even just order this, try it out, you can order it, and it comes, it's, it's a company that's in the U.S., so you can try to use, your, use it for your multi-material problems. Um, Going forward to go towards a more affordable setup that you can quickly produce, we got interested into building these hands from multiple materials. So we can actually make these robotic hands out of printed parts with skins and with ligaments and so forth. And what we did here is we made a hand that was supposed to be very low cost and still producible in a way that you can have a platform to do versatile manipulation with this. And then we used the uh, Isaac gym environments to start training with this and to learn how we can actually actuate this autonomously using PPO for this. And we could also do domain randomization and then also eventually go into like 800, 8,192 different hands that would allow us to learn a policy with reinforcement learning. 
And then uh, the first thing we did is we just learned how to have a policy that can roll a ball in the hands and do it both forward and backward rolling. We're now taking it to the next step and we're teaching the hands with a transformer how it can, for example, pick objects and drop them into a container just from based on imitations from the human. So the human demonstrates this a few times and then it learns to do this policy. And we did this now also for a couple of other tasks and we're still in the process of speeding this up um, that it can, for example, sort the blocks into blue and green. It can be wiping a few other tasks. And at the moment, I would say we're mostly dealing with more robotic basics on a robot arm control than anything else, I would say. So we also start doing cleaning up of bottles from, uh, from a container to sort them. And there is a company, and there I have a monitor interest because I'm a co-founder of this company that is trying to make a manipulation system out of this. So one of the major things that we're still missing, and I do believe the manipulation field will move into this direction, is tactile feedback. So this is something which I find fascinating. It was a study from a university in Sweden by the Johansson's lab, where they figured out that if I would numb your fingertips, you have a really hard time to do anything dexterous or anything that needs fine manipulation skills. So what ended up happening here is this lady took a long, long time to actually ignite this match. It's really difficult because she doesn't have any sensing in her fingertips. And our robotic hands that I showed you just now also didn't have that. So Jana's in the group started to investigate this question of putting a skin onto this hand and putting sensors underneath the skin to start identifying different objects and to start going in this direction. And so, yeah, we're still a long way away from getting to this level of dexterity where we can really sense very fine interactions because we also need to get a skin right, but we're going in this direction where we, we're going through lots of iterations and there's a whole team of several student, PhD students and postdocs that are just interested in optimizing this design and making it open source. So stay tuned, we will try to bring this out soon so you can start building your hands to do autonomous research with this. Um, but one of the interesting things that we're doing now is we want to go away from doing a lot of casting to what's really just printing all of it, including also the skin. So this is something where we believe you get a lot more modularity out of this than having to cast the individual elements and you can actually still get really good skin behavior from these hands. So this is an important mechanical feature of going in this direction. And another big question is to put different sensing capabilities on there. So like to actually have good stage reconstruction, even if you go away from traditional pin joints, you can use different actuation cap, um, principles and you can look into them more carefully. And the other thing you can do is actually adding tactile feedback even into your palm. So finally, I wanna just mention to you something that a group of students has been looking into this a collaboration with Steel and Chorus at ETH is how do you actually look at the world around us because for manipulation, that's going to be quite crucial. And I'm sure many of you are interested in this question. So one of the things that we wanna bring out and we are in the process of looking more carefully into this is, can we actually collect large scale deformation data from objects in the world and build up a model that you can use to train your perceptive algorithms that you could use for manipulation? May it be with an anthropomorphic hand, may it be here with a two finger gripper. And so we have a nice capture space for this that gives us these high, high fidelity um, reconstructions and we can use them to, to build first of all, the data set that you can use. And I also start postulating the idea of building surface and volumetric reconstruction algorithms that could run in real time as you're looking at the scene. So we're starting with a set of objects and I'm happy to have you tell me what objects you could throw in there for the initial set of us working in this motion capture space. But please let me know if you're interested in this and um, that's Rojo and Miguel and the team and Jan that are working on this. So finally, this is what we covered today. We talked about biohybrid swimmers. We talked about the muscles. I mentioned to you the musculoskeletal legs and these half actuators, the vision control treading work with the hands that we can build with this that are taken from a human skin with multi materials and also about the ability to bait hands that people can use in autonomous learning to actually go towards the uh, ability to actually do something by itself as an embodied agent. And I think the major challenges I had is to make better perfusion systems, to model these systems, to add proprioception, and to really create real world autonomy with these systems. This is like one of the major areas that we're looking into and everyone should probably, is probably interested in looking into these. And with this, I would like to thank the team. This is the Soft Robotics lab team at ETH. This was a, a nice outing in the Alps. So please come visit us. 
Zurich is situated quite closely to an amazing amount of hikes and climbing areas. And uh, this is the team. And uh, with this, I am uh, also want to say thank you to our funding sources that made sure that we can actually make this research happening. We have a great endowment from ETH directly, fortunately, but we also have to get additional resources to fund a bigger team that would otherwise not be possible. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. It's a high level question. So, you know, in many robotic systems, especially using either model based control or seem to be reinforcement learning, there's a general trade off between compliance and model difficulties, right? Like, for example, for human knowledge, or like a doctor's robotic hand, yeah. oftentimes you add compliance, make robot super, robot super good. However, the modeling is extremely hard. It's hard to reduce the same tool gap. It's hard to uh, design model. Yeah. Part, I guess it's part of the reason like BD switched to full electric uh, human knowledge atlas. I'm just curious how, on your like thought on how, how do you balance between them? Uh, and, how do you think we should kind of like the sim to real gap? Yeah, like balance yeah. between the the compliance and uh, the sim to real gap. Yep. Yeah. Um, the rigid body is the rigid body is way easier to simulate, right? Then right. So if you look up there for the simulation environment, let's say if I run many of these of these hands in parallel, for example, this only gives me so much, and it obviously over over learns the the prints like the the wrong physics of the simulator. Mm. And so then when you want to put this onto your hand, you still have to learn on the real hand until it really works. It allows you to already get a good starting policy. For example, it worked for making the ball rolling, but also we have a poor, a poor space to look into. So Chen Yu is currently looking into this question of, can you find a good subspace that has like a learned subspace and encoding that allows you to only explore feasible directions to speed up the simple real process? Mm. That's one direction. I mean, you could use imitation learning and have a mix, a mix of really large scale data. And there's people interested in this direction of like even like large scale video data, for example, to collect lots of video data from humans doing things. I mean, humans love to film themselves doing things and give that for free out on the internet. So you could potentially find ways of leveraging this. Um, I do think working with the real robots is completely important. And if you want to buy, let's say, if you still can get the shadow hands and buy them for 150,000 pounds, that's not really going to scale well if you want to have a robot oh, farm. Yeah. So that's why we think we need to provide to a community like open source hardware that you can use to just build that for on the orders of a few thousands or less than having to spend so much. Because I don't think it has to be so expensive to make these hands. Okay. I know you said you're still doing the modeling and fluid analysis. Yeah. But for that cramping behavior that you were seeing, have you looked at if there are any like deconstructive weights that are actually pushing the swimmer inward and could be causing that cramping behavior instead of the actual muscle? Yeah, so this would be, um, I, I do think we, you're saying that there's other effects that the cramping, be, I mean, we know from literature that if you overstimulate even it not in this configuration that you would see tetanus happening. So it's not just in this particular configuration. Um, I think there's just a certain level of where you can open and close the calcium channels and the muscle being able to recuperate in that short amount of time. I think that's just given, but yeah, I don't have an answer to it because we, we don't have the right control experiment maybe to fully prove my statement wrong, I would say. Yeah. yeah? Um, I Yes. Yeah, so we are spending every day the question of figuring out what the right sensors are on there. Um, <laughs> Do you have anything you're alive looking? So, so we, so we used these piezo resistive sensors recouped from Singapore, collaborated with us and gave them to us. You and. We found them quite tedious to make, but they do have the advantage of that they're fairly cheap to make. Eventually, once you have it figured out, you make them properly and we put them underneath the skin. But the question is, really the integration is the hard part. So to have many, many of these channels and all of the readouts to this is mm -hmm. challenging. 
and I just don't have enough manpower to like sit down and do this very properly at the moment. So the, the other thing we've been trying is there's a group one level above our lab that works more on the MEMS level and they've developed these capacitive sensor arrays which give you 144 sensing channels just on the fingertip purely using a MEMS, MEMS level produced capacitive sensor with multiple directions where each ball of these like tiny devices can be actuated. Mm -hmm. The problem here is the PhD student who did this and then also patented technology and so forth went off in the industry and um, we were, were applying for funding to get some sort of transitional funding towards commercialization and couldn't get it yet. So I would love to get that funding in to work on this, but if you don't have it, it's hard. Another thing, promising direction is I don't think like gel site is an interesting way to look into this. If you can make it small enough, can you then put it maybe in all fingers? The question is, can I screw still the tendon welding through my fingers? If I put the, the gel site needs some space to work. So digit from, uh, from Meta's uh, direction in this, right? And they're saying they're coming out with a version two and then this version two might be freely available and so forth, who knows? Um, but so I would say we have not really found a good solution. We also have looked into capacitive in a more primitive way, but it's only more for detecting where the contact is and not get really a sort of an absolute force. That's also a direction you can look into. The other question is like how much of a, I don't know what the actual like fidelity of the is. I also don't know on the top of my head, but in the fingertips, it's huge. So, like, if you look at this, like, human humongous model or something, the hands are humongous, right? With your tongue and so, like, so it, it obviously goes down as you go further away from the fingertips. So. If you go biomimicry, you would try to achieve those levels. I think you could maybe also task specifically do a simulation, and that's where simulations might be quite practical to say, how many of these sensor states do I need to properly sense contact, and how much sparsity can I introduce to still do in a reinforcement learning environment proper manipulation? But the other thing is like uh, tactile, like simulation. Yes, that's true. In, in this environment with the gym environment, we didn't we didn't really we didn't really go this route that we put sort of like projective sensors on there to investigate it. That would be a good step to do. All right. Unfortunately, we have to close down. Um, let's thank your speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you. And you can definitely contact for more conversations after the, the summit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.